Good early morning on Witness Wednesday and the last one of the year. And I'm so excited for what God has for us today. I want to talk to you about doubt. You know, if you've taken any time in Sunday school, you heard about doubting Thomas. And after Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrected and uh, Mary had seen him at the tomb, he told her, don't hang on to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. But then he came back, came back to earth. And for 40 days that he actually lost in the wilderness, God gave him 40 days for more ministry. Over 500 people saw him uh, after he returned from the dead. And remember the disciples were being charged with stealing his body to make it look like he had really resurrected. So they were in a locked room, hidden away from the authorities. And they were talking about it. Now, some had seen Jesus and some had not yet. One of those who hadn't was Thomas. Now, we know him as Doubting Thomas. And he said, unless I put my hands on his wounds and my fingers in his side, I won't believe. And several days later, through a locked door, Jesus walked in and he walked right up to Thomas. And he did not rebuke him and say, oh, you doubter. No. He said, here. Put your fingers on my wounds and, and your hand in my side. And Thomas believed and said, my Lord and my God. You know, we call him Doubting Thomas, but Jesus never called him Doubting Thomas. And there was someone else who had known Jesus his entire life. In fact, um, before John the Baptist was born, uh, Mary, pregnant with Jesus, went to see her aunt and uh, John the Baptist in his mother's womb leapt, recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. And he had known him his whole life as cousins. They, they knew each other. In fact, um, John was a promised baby and the only, or the firstborn, I don't know if they had other children, but John the Baptist was the firstborn son to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And he actually led a very separate life and uh, ended up being known as John the Baptist and he baptized Jesus in the in the wilderness at which time the Holy Spirit like a dove descended from heaven onto Jesus after that baptism and God said in a thunderous voice this is my son in whom I am well pleased so John was well acquainted with Jesus he knew his works but when he was about 33 years old, John was thrown in prison for, for confronting someone with truth. He was thrown in prison, and while in prison, he had to deal with his expectations. Now, uh, the folks who knew Jesus as the Messiah thought he came to take over the Roman government and to set things straight, to restore the earth to God's design. But that is not the enemy that Jesus came to fight. Jesus came to fight the enemy driving the people in government. And in that prison, John began to doubt. And he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask, Are you the one who was promised? Or is there one to come? And Jesus said to the disciples, Look, and right there with them, he prayed for people, he laid hands on people, they were healed and they were delivered. And he turned to John's disciples and he said, go tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. So they went back and told John. Now John started to doubt because what Jesus' ministry looked like was not what was expected. And the devil began to tell John this is not the one. So John, instead of believing that, sent word to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we wait for another? That happens in our relationships too. When things don't go as expected, 
Satan will tell us that is not the one for you. And those doubts can grow, but we have a choice. We, we have to believe what God has already shown us. So John had a life of 33 years of knowing the truth. And if he can doubt, we can doubt, right? But we must go back to the Word of God. Now, we have the written Word of God today. John didn't have access to, you know, the New Testament and all the wonderful things written about Jesus. But he had his own witness of the Holy Spirit in him. And still, he doubted and asked, are you the one or should we wait for another? But still, when those disciples of John arrived, Jesus didn't go, oh, great, you know, doubting John? No, Jesus never reprimanded. He only gave what was needed to believe. So the same is true with you. The same is true with me. Every one of us has something that we need to believe. And I pray that if you are a believer, you will rejoice that Jesus knew that and he came and gave it right to you. Of course, it wasn't putting my hands on Jesus' wounds or my fingers in his side, but it was something else, and he knew what I needed, and he brought it to me, and I believed. We have to remember when doubts come, when the devil tells us, this is not the right one for you. Go back to what the Word has said. That should be our standard for living. Now, when there were doubts, Jesus said, look at this, listen to this, and then go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. The same for us. I want to share with something um, I experienced. So years ago, um, while I was homeschooling my children, and we homeschooled for 15 years, I actually founded and uh, established a homeschool co-op. And we had, I don't know, 20 or 30 families together. We had a university school model of K through 12 and we um, operated in the basement of a church and we met twice a week so the students could choose physics, chemistry, Spanish, Latin, whatever their uh, you know, subject choices were and we had parents in that area teach and as one of the kind of team building exercises that first year one of the family members decided let's all go on a camping trip together well, my idea of camping is like Hampton Inn, but, but I went. I slept in a bunkhouse. I had to walk about a half a mile for a bathroom. And, um, you know, I'm glad I, I've only had to do that a few times in life. But here's what was happening there. I was getting everybody set up, and, of course, me being the responsible person for everybody, I was making sure everybody was established, safe, set up. And finally, it was time for me to go back to check out um, our lunchroom which was on site there. And when I walked up, I saw a bunch of ladies um, you know, chattering, I'm gonna say. I could tell what was happening. Something was off. And they kept looking toward a girl and a, three young boys over kind of toward the edge of the woods alone. And I walked closer to here. And these uh, three or four women were really saying very bad things about this young lady. I think she was 13 or 14. And I said, hey guys, what are you talking about? Well, this girl over there, how dare she? She's over there with those boys. And, um, you know, she was an early bloomer. I was an early bloomer. When I was 13, I was often mistaken for 18 years old. Um, so, you know what I'm talking about. She was very voluptuous already. And, you know, she has the tools, but no owner's manual, right? So I said, ladies, uh, you know, where's her mother? And they said, she's not. Their parents, her parents aren't here. She's ridden with some other family. I said, well, you know, I'm a Christian woman, and I believe in you know, talking to you myself instead of talking about you. I just want to say, for you to stand here and judge her, this 13, 14-year-old girl who's just coming into her blossom, doesn't know how to handle hormones and all kinds of stuff, and who naturally is attracted to boys, is actually in a very vulnerable situation because these three and one is never an environment that you should allow a young lady in. Well, they turned up their noses and, well, I never. I did it gently, don't get me wrong, but I did have to confront that attitude of judging this 13, 14-year-old girl 
instead of instructing her, okay? So I walked over and said, hey, can I talk to you? She said, sure. I said, hey, I wanna, I wanna just you know, reintroduce myself. My name is Crystal. And I noticed that you're standing over here with these young men. And I said, I, I wanna talk to you about your womanhood. And I said, you have a very beautiful body. God has blessed you. You have blossomed early. And I just want you to know that God created your body. It's, it's the highest level of art that God created. But he also wants you to be pure, which means to be careful how you use your body. And I said, you know, I don't know these young men's character, but I will tell you that just naturally, you know, girls and boys separate alone, and especially when there's more than one boy, it's not a good idea. And um, I'd like for you to come over here and help me out in the kitchen. So I talked to her a little bit about personal integrity, making sure she wasn't in an environment where she was away from adults and not to ever be alone with a boy, things like that. And then when her parents got there, I told them about the discussion. Well, what I didn't know was happening was another woman was in the group looking at all of this happening uh, from a distance. So after the camping trip was all over, about a week later, this other mother contacted me. She was actually a Muslim and was a part of our group. Her child was in our homeschool co-op. And she said, Crystal, I saw what you did at the campsite. I saw what those other women did. I heard them talk about that young lady for a long time and judge her. And then you walked up. And then you walked up and you walked over. And you rescued that young lady from a life of a bad reputation. And you corrected her gently. And she said, I am a Muslim. In my country, you can be killed for adultery or having sex before marriage. She said, I'm, I'm having an affair. She said, I've gotten caught in this sin. And, um, you know, when I first married into my husband's family, my brother-in-law told me, if you ever commit adultery, I will kill you. And then regularly he has reminded me for just $20, I can have someone kill you and get rid of the body and no one would ever know. She said, the penalty for adultery in my country is death, and I have committed that sin. She said, but when I saw how you talked to that young woman, I wanted to talk to you. And I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That just still speaks to my heart. Because she never would have seen Jesus in those women who were judging that girl. Now, I'm not saying I'm better. I've grown. I've, I've learned. <laughs> uh, but gossip, I hate. I hate gossip. And uh, I, have a, I have a personal definition. I think gossip is such that if you're talking about somebody who's not present and you give the person you're with a bad impression of a third party who's not there to defend himself, that's gossip. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. Um, you shouldn't talk about the one who's not present. And in fact, I say honor the one not present. If you do that, you'll keep your mouth out of trouble. So... What does this all mean? We are to lift Jesus up so that all men can be drawn to him. And when we do that in our lives, we'll be able to change other lives. We'll be able to show that yes, in fact, Jesus is the one and we're not waiting for someone else to come. But until he does return, I am going to allow Jesus to love other people through me. And when doubts come and they will come, you have a choice. I just ask you, do not believe a lie. Satan will tell you that's not the one for you. That's not the one to come. Jesus isn't the one. But you go before God yourself and you ask. You ask God, the true and living God, if you haven't already done that. And you just say, if Jesus is the one, show me that he's the one. So, I'd love to pray with you if you would like. Uh, you can message me. I'll call you personally. But I just want to encourage you today. Take captive every thought. And if it is a thought of doubt, identify it. Because you don't really know what you're letting in until you start to identify it. Don't let the enemy tell you because of something that has happened or because of the expectation you had that was not met, 
Because remember, everybody thought Jesus was coming to overthrow the Roman government. And you know, we, <laughs> we have a certain governmental situation ourselves <laughs> right now. Don't look at what's happening with the government on earth, but focus on what is driving the government. And by that, I mean that spiritual realm. Now, you know, most people believe in angels. I have a guardian angel and we have angels on our Christmas tree. And it's easy to believe for that good stuff, right? But the reality is the arch enemy of God, the fallen angels are also here real and at work. So don't believe the lies of the enemy, but instead walk in faith. And the good news is that God gives everyone a measure of faith. It's our job to um, water it, to grow it, to fertilize it, which actually reminds me of my my thesis for my Master of Theology degree. It was on poop, which is a future, probably a Witness Wednesday. Um, but just to mention that, when you're deciding what to think and what to do and what to believe, you can put poop on something and it's very toxic. It'll kill the thing, right? It'll kill you. Dysentery, E. coli. But when you process it, it becomes manure. Manure is beneficial, adds nutrients, and it can create growth. So take the doubt and the unmet or even unrealistic expectations in your life and present those before the Lord and have faith. You guys have a great day and if I can pray for you, I'd love to. Just message me. Thanks. And I'll see you next year. Bye-bye.